second chapter, beginning at verse 2. I'm going to read quite a bit of this chapter, um, and then we'll digress for a moment and talk a little bit about the, uh, what it's doing here. Verse, verse 1 says, The angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore, that's not a question you want God asking you. Therefore, verse 3, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke to these, these words to all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. Somebody say, and wept. And wept. Then they called the name of the place Bochim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. And when Joshua had dismissed the people, the children of Israel went to each went each to his own inheritance to possess the land. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old. Somebody go, wow. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at Timnah Heres, in the mountains of Ephraim on the north side of Mount Gosh. Verse 10. When all the generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them, who, after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. That's where the United States is right now. Verse 11. Then the people of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them in out of the land of Egypt, and they followed other gods from among the gods of all the people who were all around them, and they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Asherahs, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, so he delivered them into the hands of the plunderers who despoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of the enemies all around so that they could no longer stand before their enemies." Wherever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for calamity, as the Lord had said and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and quickly and other gods and bowed down to them. They turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandment of the Lord, and they did, and they did not do so. You all can be seated. I was going to finish that. but So what we have here in this chapter really is a rehearsal of what uh, happened when God brought Israel out of Egypt. And then... Uh, Chapter 3 goes on to talk about, you know, the things that are going to happen as they look forward. And so God here is reminding them that he's a God who doesn't break his covenant. And because he's a God who doesn't break his covenant, you can depend on what God says to you. And so what happened with these folks is they did exactly the thing that God told them not to do. They went out and found themselves uh, in amongst the people that didn't serve God, a people that who weren't uh, spiritual at all, didn't have the presence of God, didn't worship the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but they worshiped false gods. And the Lord brought them, uh, when he brought them to that place, he told them, you know, don't do that. But they determined that they were going to do it anyway. And because they determined that they were going to do it anyway, they found themselves in a hard place. And the Lord reminded them when he said, why have you done this? You know, sometimes what happens is we get ourselves in trouble when God told us not to do something and we go ahead and do it. 
And the Lord is saying to us, why would you do that? I told you not to do that. It's like the guy that goes to the doctor and he's got this pain. He goes, doctor, this hurt. it hurts when I do this. And the doctor said, well, don't do that then. So, so anyway. But what happens with us sometimes is we do things that we shouldn't be doing. And because of that, we find ourselves at odds with God. Now, it's, it's a bad thing to be at odds with God because he's got all the power anyway and all the glory belongs to him. So what happens with us is we find ourselves at odds with God, but uh, how do I get back there to the place? Now, we're blessed because uh, Jesus gave his life for you and I, and he not only gave his life for us, but he sends the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to remind us what Jesus did for us so that we can find our way back to God uh, in a big hurry. But these guys, they didn't get it, and so they spent this whole time in the book of Judges, as you read it through, how they would another judge would be raised up, and then what ha would happen is uh, they would fall, and then another judge would hap would uh, be raised up, and all these continuation of the way they were living their lifestyles continued to uh, trip them up, and so what happens with the, uh, these people is they find themselves in, between a rock and a hard place in regards to being with God. And so the Lord is telling them, you know, how to walk in wisdom and understanding. In Proverbs, the ninth, ninth chapter, verse 10, says, 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So what happens is, is when God is speaking, we should be listening. I believe that God is speaking to our nation right now. But we're still not listening. And what we're seeing, uh, what we've been seeing is uh, chaos that has been upon us across our land. Chaos like we've not known. Would you agree with that? That there's things happening in our nation. We never thought we'd see those things happening. But they're happening now. And I can tell you that the main reason that they're happening now is because we've left God out of our lives. When you serve God, you not only serve God, but you serve his ways. And his ways are higher than our ways. And because his ways are higher than our ways, then we should serve his ways. But what happens to us is we find ourselves amongst people who don't know the God of heaven and earth. The scriptures talk about it uh, as you look there in verse 10. It says, when a generation had been gathered to their fathers and another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done. Now, why didn't they know the Lord? They didn't know the Lord because nobody told them about it. Now, our job is to do what? Be witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And because that's our job and our duty, what God has given us is an ability to do that through the power of the Spirit that works in us. But if we don't share the gospel of Jesus Christ and people who, who he is, then they're not going to know. You know, people are out uh, burning churches in America. Well, why are they burning churches? Because they think, they think that uh, um, Americans, you know, serve this false god. You know, and he's, he's uh, a god who's very demanding and, and uh, very rigorous and a hater uh, in, in his ways. But the truth is, God's not a hater. He's a lover. And because God is a lover... He'll separate us from the sin that we want to get a hold of, which will hurt us. It will take us down in ways and in places which we shouldn't go and bring misery into our lives. But you know, God doesn't want you and I to walk in misery. He wants us to walk in love and grace and the power of, of the ministry that he's given to us. And so when we're out amongst people, you know, a lot of those people are hurting. They're hurting the way that you were hurting before you found God. They're hurting deep down inside, and they don't know how to get away from it. But the truth is, we've got the simple message of Jesus living within our hearts. And so, 
God's covenant, he makes a covenant. He says, if you'll walk in my covenant, then I'm going to bless you. Watch, Judges 2, 1 says this. Then the angel of the Lord, how many know that's Jesus Christ here? You know that. You can, you can go down a little bit further and see. They always uh, emphasize him in certain ways to let us know that this is Jesus. And then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Brokham and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land where I swore to your fathers that I said, I will never break my covenant with you. So Jesus has said it there, and he said it at the cross. Of course, the eternal covenant of the blood, he'll never break with us because we are washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. And so that eternal covenant, it lives forever. What happens with us is we get ourselves outside the framework of the covenant by the things we do. And so what happens is God has given us an ability to get back in. He's given us an ability to repent, to ask for forgiveness. Now listen, God uh, works greatly in our lives, but what happens sometimes is people do things so much and so often that they become, uh, their heart becomes hardened to be able to reach back to get a hold of God. And I've talked to people that have fallen away from God and sometimes for some of them, you know, sometimes some of them come back, you know, when you're talking to them. For sometimes for some of them, they say, well, I've tried to come back and I just can't. I, I can't make it in. I can't get past where I'm at. You know what that is? That's the closure of repetitive sin in our lives. Repetitive sin will eventually harden the heart. You believe it? I mean, I know that what happens in people's lives is because of that, they desire to get back to God somewhat, but haven't, haven't been able to find how to get there. Exodus, the 34th chapter, tells us a few things about this. Verse 10 of Exodus 34 says, Behold, I make a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such as has not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and in all the people among you are, shall see the work of the Lord. For it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I'm driving out from before you the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and all the otherites. Take heed to yourself lest you make a covenant with the inhabitant of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your midst. I think that in the United States, we've seen, uh, and, I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to be a little harsh with them, but I think some of our politicians don't need to be in office. You know, I think some of them are downright heathenistic. And they say and do things that are so opposed to the way of life that we have here in these United States. And we're not perfect in our nation. I tell you, we've been sliding for a long time. You know, and one of the things that has caused us to slide more, more rapidly is this abortion issue. I'm praying still that God would give us the ability to reverse that because it's a curse that has come to every one of us. And, you know, unfortunately, some of our money that they gather for taxes goes to support these, these issues. And, uh, you know, I think that anybody that has had an abortion has got some real pain in their lives that's going on. And they need, they need the help and the glory of God. And uh, so we need to reach out to them. And not hate them because of it, but to reach out to them. But the truth is, we're not for that. You know, the, God said this to these ancient tribes, and part of what they did was sacrifice children to their gods and their perversions. 
And they did these things. And God said, don't go over there with them. Don't be there with them. Don't make a covenant with them. And don't agree with them in any way. A covenant brings agreement. And so if you make a covenant with them, you agree with them. Or if you agree with them, it brings a covenant along together with that. So what happens is, is God told us not to agree with those. Listen, I'm sorry, but I don't agree with protesters doing what they're doing right now. Number one, I don't think most of them are protesters. I think most of them are rioters, what I've seen. And so what happens is, is they're bent that way. Why are they bent that way? Because they've never learned the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord can help a a family bring discipline into their children so that they they know the right way to go. And we've got a lot of young people in our day that are doing these crazy th- uh, stunts that they're doing out in Washington and you know, uh, all over the place, Seattle and Portland, all these places, because they think that there's no retribution. Well, even if nobody catches them, God sees And God will judge. Some have said, well, you know, I did it a long time ago and God never judged. Listen, if you didn't repent about it and ask God to forgive you and make restitution sometimes, the truth is what happens is God, he remembers. You know, he's omniscient. You know what that means? He's all-knowing. And if you're all-knowing, that means that you don't forget what you already learned. Okay. So what we need to do in our lives is to retain that favor that God has given to us. I titled this Fearful or Favor. You know, we're going to be, if we don't have God working in our lives and ministering into our lives, and when we go out that door to be able to be uh, the kind of person that shares the gospel and ministers to others and helps others in some ways to minister the way God directs you to, what happens is, you know, we're not really following what God has for us. And I believe that what God's called us to do, every one of us, is to serve in a very special way and be able to minister and to get a hold of the presence of God and cause people to be introduced to God. You know, across our nation, there's churches that are closed everywhere. And, you know, some that we follow and uh, the pastors and the leaders of the churches, they're closed everywhere. And people don't know what to do in some of them. And they're doing, getting involved in some bad issues, some things that are happening in in these protests and different things, making declaration about uh, different uh, groups that are involved in these uh, protests. Listen, anybody that brings physical harm to somebody else is, uh, in my opinion, my humble opinion, but brings physical harm to somebody else, you know, that person's doing something wrong. Hello? And, you know, we, we act like the, we, we want to let them get away with it, not me, I'm sorry. You know, I, I paid the price for, uh, to live in a nation where I can serve and honor God and that also my family is free from being uh, accosted and, and being hurt in our nation. Keeping covenant and retaining favor. Mark, the fourth chapter, verse 21 through 23, says this. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. So what's this saying? This is telling us that in our keeping of covenants, our covenant is to shine the light. Wherever we go, we're to shine the light. Let it, let it be seen. Let it be understood that that light represents the life that we can have. Rather than walking in darkness, we can live in the light that God has given to us. Uh, And God told us that what we should do, 
By the way, I think it's a very important thing to do what God says to do. Hello? Someone said, well, that's Old, Old Testament. And I always have the same question every time. When did it stop being real? When did it stop being the truth? In my understanding, the, the Bible says that the word of God is forever. And because it's forever, it's always true. And it's always been true. And it's always going to be true. So if God's word has always been true and God's word is always going to be true, then the truth is with the old covenant, it's still truth to us. Someone says, well, we don't have to pay any attention to it anymore. That's wrong. You don't understand what the, the real meat in the word of God means if you have that thing in your heart that says, well, I just, I just pay attention to the New Testament now. You know, there, there is no New Testament without the foundation of the Old Testament. Isaiah 52, 11 says, depart, depart. Go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Be clean, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. Wow. I mean, that's Isaiah, Old Testament, but he says that we are bearing vessels. Well, guess what? You are now the vessel of God. And you're bearing the presence and the glory of God in your life. But it says that we are to uh, be clean. And in order to be able to be clean, we have to stay washed. And if we're washed in the blood, it's eternal so we can stay washed as long as we remember that we always are washed in the blood. And the sacrifice, how great it was. Beyond anything that we can even imagine in ourselves. But God gave of himself so that you and I could be clean like he's clean. Wow. So the Lord is telling us that we should keep that covenant in order to be able to retain the favor of God. Listen, favor with God is what you need in life. You know, it's one thing to have favor with men. Jesus sought that as well. He grew in knowledge and favor with God and men, is what the scriptures say. But they put, put it in the right order with God and with men. So that favor that we have, if you carry the favor of God with you, you can't help but be blessed. Because God is with you. If you have the favor of God with you. Now what brings the favor of God is to keep a covenant with God. Because he made the covenant with you and I. Just like he made the covenant with all other believers who accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ within our lives. And those who are outside that are making havoc and, and bringing pain and, and doing illegal things and, and uh, burning churches, those are people that are outside the covenant of God. It's not funny. Not even be a remotely humorous. What happens? There was some young man, I, I read it uh, yesterday uh, in the news, uh, some young man that uh, had thrown a, uh, like a grenade, a concussion grenade. And uh, he got caught. You know, God will find you out. <laughs> he got caught. You know how he got caught? His grandma bought him a vest and she saw when he threw the concussion grenade that he was the one that threw it because she recognized the vest that he was wearing listen god bless that grandmother because i know that had to be hard that had to be hard to turn him in but the truth is she did the right thing you know if we if we'll just do the right thing oftentimes life will become so much easier for us. You know, not the thing always that we want to do, because let's, let's be honest, sometimes we don't always want to do the right thing, because it's not advantageous. 
Hello? Just kind of digging down where we all live here. But the truth is, if we'll do the right thing, God's favor will be upon us and he'll be with us. God's conditions are eternal. When God makes a covenant, it's eternal. It's for eternity. Now, what nullifies a covenant is what we do, not what he does. And because we can nullify a covenant by what we do, we should be uh, very careful to do what God says to do. Psalm, the 89th chapter, verse 34 says, My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Verse 35, Once I have sworn it by my holiness, I will not lie to David. And he goes on to talk about some things with David. So the covenant that we have with God is eternal. And because it's eternal, guess what? I'm assured that God's not going to break his covenant with me. If I will walk the walk. If you will walk the walk. If you'll do the things that sometimes they, aren't, they don't seem very expedient. You know, there's, if I did it this way, you know, I could cut corners or whatever. And sometimes cutting corners is the wrong thing to do. Are you with me on that? So what happens with us is because we're cutting corners sometimes, we get ourselves on the edge. Anybody ever been on the edge? Yeah. So I don't like to be on the edge. How about you? My wife and I, we were out in Grand Canyon and I wanted to look over. <laughs> you can imagine. <laughs> I heard about that. <laughs> but the truth is, that was an awesome view when you looked over. <laughs> but you see, someone's always looking out for you. You know what's, what's beautiful about the body of Christ? We should be looking out for each other. You know, not that we got to rule people's lives or, you know, stick a thumb down on them and this is what you got to do. The truth is, you know, people are going to do what people are going to do. But if they know you love them and say, you know, I, I don't know if I'd do that if I was you, you know, or whatever, they're going to listen, Hopefully. You know, the pastors always have this, someone wants to come to us, they'll come to us, and they want to do something that it's either going to hurt them, it's going to mess up their, their trajectory on life, you know what that means, don't you? They're going to miss the sun as they go by, it'll be in a rear view mirror. So what happens is, Pastors say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that I do. Have you really prayed about that? Have you really thought about Oh, yeah, I've prayed and prayed and prayed about it. Don't, ba don't brag on how much you pray. Because the truth is, most of us don't pray enough. Are you with me? The rest of you, I'll say that again just for, <laughs> just for the sake of it. Don't brag about praying because most of us don't pray enough. We don't worship enough. You know, we're, God, God loves being with us. And we don't want to spend an, a, a, as much time with him as he wants with us sometimes. Because we got other things to do. You know, when it comes to God, I don't think there's anything in life that's more important So God's called us to walk a covenant of love. I'm winding this down here for you. Matthew 12, 35 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasures brings forth evil things. <clears throat> we don't like to use that word anymore. Evil. We, we like, almost don't like to use that word as much as we don't like to use the word hell. How many believe there's a hell? <clears throat> when you look in the 
New Testament, you're reading, of course, hell is described in the Old Testament, Old Covenant as well. In, one, <clears throat> in the book of Matthew, in one chapter, Jesus mentions hell three different times. So if Jesus recognizes that there's a hell, I'm thinking there's a hell. I'm also thinking that's a place you don't want to go. <clears throat> don't prepare your luggage for that. Because it doesn't matter what you wear, it's going to be hot. Luke twenty two twenty. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. You know, that had to be humiliating because these, the twelve... You know, they were the, they're the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And they're sitting down with Jesus. And he's saying, I have to die for you to shed blood because you, you're too corrupt to go the way you are. You'll never make heaven the way you are. But I have to die and shed my blood for you. That's what he said, isn't it? He said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for you. YOU is not a new university. Just look back in your own life. YOU means I didn't learn it too well. And I've got to continue to learn it. But the truth is, Jesus, he didn't brag about it. He just accepted the fact that he needed to die for you and I. There's other people out here that Jesus needs to die for, that Jesus died for, that they need to receive what he died for. For Sometimes <clears throat> I was having this discussion with my brother and we were talking about it. The truth is, you could, you can uh, receive what God has for you by you know, watching a TV show or listening to it on the radio or whatever. But there's absolutely no substitute for you taking your body and bringing it to the house of God and taking a time to engage with God with the other believers. Because there's something that happens in that for other believers. You know, we come to church a lot of times only to see what we can get. Are you there? When actually what you have within you should be the kind of stuff that helps people receive what God has for them through you. Because you and I are carriers of what comes out of heaven. And what we're sharing and what we're ministering to other people is that very thing God has for us uh, that comes through other people. Now, sometimes we can get a bit ornery with one another. And we shouldn't do that. Because you know what happens then? Then you got to go back around and make it up. You know, say you're sorry and be, be truthful, mean it. To receive what God has for us. Because the body of Christ is important. And the body of Christ didn't go to church and left part of its body at home. The body of Christ brings us all into the house of God. You know what? The other thing about that uh, that we don't understand sometimes is the decisions that we make, we don't even consider the body of Christ in them. I've had people, you know, my, my wife and I were, I guess it was last year, I don't know, we were down in Florida. And someone had sent me an email a couple months before that, told me about all the things that they wanted to do and sit and learn and be a part and, you know, all that stuff. And then we get a phone call about halfway through our time in Florida, telling us, well, we're not going to be at church anymore because we think we're more Presbyterian than 
or Baptist or something than something else. <clears throat> and you know, I'm I'm not going to tell anybody what they, you know, think think they ought to be when it comes to that. The truth is, are you a Christian and are you planted where God wants you? Because what happens is sometimes we don't get um, we don't get enough recognition. Let me just say it that way about who we are. And so it sends us on to the next location because we don't get enough recognition. You know the way you get re recognized in the body of Christ? Does anybody know? Serving. Serving is it's cool. I mean, you know, you can serve and you really, <clears throat> I think that, you know, what we should all do is, is desire to serve more and seek out ways to serve more. And, you know, that, someone said, well, I'm doing enough. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Uh, don't go there with that. <laughs> because the truth is, you might not be doing enough. And, uh, I mean, sometimes you are doing enough. I remember my pastor had called me into the office one time, right down there. <clears throat> said, uh, I've been wanting to talk to you about this. I thought, uh oh, <laughs> I'm in trouble. He said, no. He said, uh, you know, do you realize you're doing 17 things in the church serving? I said, no, I didn't really think about it that way. He said, well, I'm going to back you off on some of those things because you need to spend more time with your family. I appreciated that. But the truth is, sometimes we can do too many things. But most of the time, we don't. You know, and we should make, when we make covenant that we're going to do something, though, we should do it. What's the scripture say? It's better to, what is it? It's better to, to not, not do, to promise and not do than it is to not promise and do anyway. I probably got that backwards. But the ha what happens with us sometimes is we promise something and then we never follow through. Yeah. <laughs> so what we should do, uh, we used to have a saying in the business world that it's, it's better to... Uh, under promise and over produce than it is to over promise and under produce another way of saying it because the truth is what happens with this is we're generally we're generally recognized by what we said we do and then do it than the other way around not do it so to be generally recognized by god we should always make covenant to do what god wants for us isaiah 5 This is where we're at in America today. It says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. The Lord uh, speaks to us in that second chapter of the book of Judges, and he talks about the things that we, we do and what we don't do. Verse 17 says, they, quick, they turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked. How many of you have recognized how quickly things have turned in these last few months? I mean, it's, it's like, it's scary how fast things turn. But I believe one of the reasons is because the church, not uh, us specifically, but in general, the church has, not, has relinquished its position in these United States. We have backed away from our position of calling right, right, good, good, or bad, bad. So what happens is because we've backed away and become the quote-unquote silent majority, the devil has taken the position that they're not going to say anything anyway, so let's do it. Let's take another step into the darkness and another step into the darkness, leading our nation into darkness. 
And I believe that what we should do is turn around and start using our voices to say what is right and what is wrong. They say that politicians, a lot of times, if they sometimes would only even get five or six phone calls for something that they're going to vote on or uh, advance, if, if they get five or six phone calls of people that object to it, they wouldn't do it. I wonder how many things could have been stopped. You know, we can't take all the responsibility here, but I think the church nationwide needs to start speaking out and saying what's right and what's not right in regards to the way that uh, churches conduct their services. You know, I don't have anything to say about that. That's between them and the Lord. But some things in which churches allow are things that I believe that hurts the heart of God. When people are allowed to you know, live in uh, relationships that are unclean, unsanctified, un unmarried, relationships like that, and people are <clears throat> accepted wholeheartedly into the houses of God. I think that we can accept people, but we have to say that, you know, you're, you're doing this and it's wrong. And eventually, a pastor has to step up and say, if you continue in that, you're not going to be able to stay here. Because what happens is, how many know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Now, that's what the scripture says. And so, as leaders, sometimes we're misjudged or we're judged harshly by the things that we tell people because we're not looking to destroy them, we're looking to build them. And people don't understand that. You know, the truth is, if, if you have a pastor that loves you, which you have pastors here that love you, and something comes along, and we say something to you that may bring a, a correction, don't get mad at us. Get mad at God. If that's, <laughs> You know, because we're in prayer, we're seeking God, and we may call you and say, hey, you know, what's going on with you? Are you all right? Is everything okay? You know, just to begin some dialogue that may be able to help you. Because I know this much, that darkness brings dread in people's lives. Do you understand that? Darkness, the Bible says men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But it brings dread within a person's life in the way that they live and the direction they're going. and You know, that's what God was saying to the nation here, and he had gone over and over and over with them about the things that needed to be done. But the truth is, in your life, because you come to this house, you say that this is the place that I'm being fed. But what happens is, some people say, well, I don't like what you're spooning up right now. <laughs> well, I'm only spooning it up because God said that's what you need. And I, I, I think that pastors, the problem with most huge mega churches is they don't want to do that. Because, you know, someone's going to walk out the door if they do that. Well, I've been pastoring and pastoring pastor 25 years. And we've been in the ministry serving as leaders, pastors for another 20 years. So we've been at it for a long time. And we've seen a lot of things happen over those years. And a lot of people have wounded themselves and hurt themselves and hurt their families. And we've tried to talk to them. And sometimes it, what comes along is, you know, that's none of your business or you don't, you know, you stay out of that because I don't want you in that or, you know, whatever. People have bold ways of saying things at times. But the truth is, if you're called to leadership, pastoral leadership, you don't have a right to not say something. You know, if, if you think you have a right to not say anything, you're better off to go sell cars or something. I don't know. Whatever it is you do. Because the truth is, God has called us to cleanse 
and to bring uh, that cleansing. You know, we're not the saviors. There's only one savior. His name is Jesus Christ. But uh, he helps us in times when we're saying things. And I know that Pastor Pam, uh, several years ago, a young lady was, we weren't even at this location, a young lady was uh, coming to the church and uh, she had she had a, an abrasive way about herself, what can I say? And uh, she thought that the right thing to do was to take that abrasive thing out on Pastor Pam. That didn't work. Didn't work for her, and it sure didn't work for me. <laughs> you know, but people don't understand sometimes, you know, they have gifts and talents and abilities. Just because you have a gift doesn't mean that, uh, that you're to use it all the time. Hello? Amen. Why don't you stand with me? I am mindful that the church has a place in this coming next few months that if we don't take it, take our position, you know, we're going to end up with what we don't want.